You're listening to the Real Estate Entrepreneur Podcast with Terrence Murphy, where we cover sales, investing, and entrepreneurship with an emphasis on real estate. Each podcast, Terrence and his guests will bring you informative and inspiring information within the real estate industry. So we have an amazing guest on the Real Estate Entrepreneur with Terrence Murphy, Luke Marvel, broker and founder of Boxwood Real Estate. Luke graduated summa cum laude from Pepperdine University and quickly became a successful real estate broker and entrepreneur. With over $200 million in sales and over 60 properties flipped, 350 residential properties built and constructed, and as an active investor of owning 25 properties personally, he's had an amazing career. He was the chief real estate officer of the barracks. Luke leveraged that experience within the operational and financial aspects of the construction, development, sales, and leasing portions of the business. His expertise helped create an on-site leasing, property management business, that manages over a hundred million in assets. He helped cut costs and effectively double profit margin and led the development and one of the largest student housing communities in the U S in 2016, Luke was named century 21's number one agent in the United States, in the nation and top 50 agents in the wall street journal. Currently he's partnering on several residential developments, totaling over 100 residential units in Houston college station, and surrounding markets. This guy's doing some amazing stuff. Excited to have him on the show. So we're here on the Real Estate Entrepreneur Podcast with Terrence Murphy. I got a great friend here with me today, Luke Marvel, founder, broker of of Boxwood Real Estate. I've known this dude for almost 10 years now. Yeah, it's crazy. We've done a lot of deals together. He's got an amazing story, amazing track record in the real estate game, and he is the atypical uh, real estate entrepreneur. So thanks for being on the show today with me, man. Hey, thanks for having me, man. It's always, yeah. good to, always good to spend time with you. Always, bro. So we're going to talk today, just talk some shop. I want to start off with a, a quote like I always do. So true humility is, is staying humble and teachable regardless of how much you know, Dr. George Frazier. So that leads us into our com- in our relationship. We are always sharing ideas. We're always talking shop. We're always talking real estate. So just walk me through your story from A to Z. I mean, Ground up to college, marriage, real estate. Just walk me through your story. Tell me how you got to this point in real estate. Yeah, definitely. So I went to uh, Pepperdine University, Los Angeles area, Malibu. So Malibu, uh, Malibu. it was tough. It was really tough. <laughs> so <laughs> we had to look at the ocean every day. Yeah. And majored in basically finance and business there. So always had this desire. It's kind of weird going back to like middle school and high school. I even like wrote these papers on wanting to own. I, it was own real estate and hotels. It was kind of like this call. Like didn't my parent, my dad was a doctor. My mom stayed at home. So there was no like history in it. Yeah. But went to Pepperdine. They didn't really have a real estate major. So I majored in finance, got out. Uh, well, while I was at Pepperdine, met my wife, Brittany. Um, who was from Dallas area and got out and basically had a job lined up kind of in a corporate finance and accounting role with a defense contractor. Really good experience. What year was that? What year that was 2008. Got? Okay. Yeah. So I worked for them about a year, my last year of college as well. And then they, you know, they moved me out to Dallas, worked for them for about two and a half till early 2011. And at that point, I mean, honestly, I think there's always kind of that pivot point where it's like you have this desire, you have this longing to, for me, it was to, to do real estate, but um, there almost needs to be that something that kind of pushes you off the edge. Yep. So uh, for me, it was my wife wanted to go to vet, veterinary school uh, and the, it's A&M obviously is like number two and number one in the country for vet schools. She got in um, and that kind of pushed me to say, I don't want to live three hours away from my wife. I have this, I have this career that I'm, I'm thinking about, I'm about to quit. Mm -hmm. So why don't we use my salary and why don't we buy like our first investment property or home? So that's the start into real estate. That was really the start into real estate. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's cool. Cause I always say if you're in college station and you're not an Aggie, you got to have a story on how you got here. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a small college town and and people always ask me, where is it located? No one knows Brian. I always have to say college station (laughs) and A&M, but It's right in the middle of the triangle. Yeah. This exact, I do the little thing with my hand. I'm like, Dallas, Houston, Austin, yeah. San Antonio, we're right in the middle. Right that's in the middle. it. So. Yeah. So, so that's how you got in the industry, bought that yep. first house. And then what did you do after that? 
So I actually met uh, the, the agent that sold us that first house. I kind of maintained a relationship with. And about a year after that, so it, it kind of long an aside, but we leveraged and something I push a lot of people, I've pushed a lot of people to do over the years is to buy their first house as a duplex, you know, because mm, you smart. can you can take advantage of three and a half percent down, occupy one side and then rent out the other, yeah. you know, where any other situation you have to have at least 25% down. So it's kind of constantly thinking, critically thinking how to how to leverage uh, you know, either lending or compliance regulations kind of mm-hmm. to your benefit. Um, Love that. But uh so we did that and then and then about a year later, it got to that tipping point where I was just tired of commuting. And so I, I quit my job and went into to real estate sales full time. Yeah, that's good. Uh, so that's that's really how I got into it, you know. And then from there, I mean, obviously, you want me to go through kind of the rest of it. Well, I'd love to unpack this scenario, and then we'll jump back into real estate okay. sales going forward. So yeah. if if I'm a listener or my audience, and I'm brand new into the game, mm-hmm. let's say I'm a first time home buyer or a first time investor, yep, or a first time whatever. Walk me through that scenario on the duplex, 3.5% down versus 20 to 25% down. Walk me through what that looks like. Yeah. So a primary residence in mm-hmm. general, um, as long as it's four units or under, you need, you know, really it starts at like three and a half to 5% down. Yep. Uh, and I say 5% because three and a half with fees a lot of times equals about 5%. Give or take. And those are FHA or conventional, conventional yep. under 5%. Yep. But you have to live there. Correct. Um, the other, obviously, the other option is you're buying it for investment. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that starts, single family start at 20% down. And then multifamily, so two, two units and up, starts at 25% down. Yep. So there really is kind of this strategy to say, uh, and it, it can be duplex, it can be single family as well, but the duplex is really good. Because you have half the income being made, paid for by somebody else. Correct. So, for example, we bought this duplex with three and a half percent down, very, very little. Mm-hmm. And after you took into account what the other side was paying, I mean, I think our our quote mortgage or rent was about four hundred bucks a month. Wow. You know, and we had somebody paying probably over a thousand dollars in equity into our loan every month too. So, love it. It's a great deal. Um, and obviously, you can parlay that. You know, I've coached several or multiple people on this, but you can probably that into future deals. So you own that for a year or two, and then you you get up basically more down payment, and you say, "I'm going to go buy a single family home or another duplex for three and a half to five percent down." And you just keep replicating. And keep it. it, yeah. And you can, exactly over yeah. ten years, you can end up with five, six, seven properties, actually pretty easily with with effectively probably five percent down. Yeah, and so probably in the first twelve to twenty four months, you get your capital back just yeah on you know, equity pay down or cash flow. Yep. And so, exactly. So, if I'm a new investor, my question is you said someone else is paying a thousand dollars towards, what does that look like for me? That means somebody's paying my note down, or why would I do that? I mean, obviously, <laughs> yeah. but you know. no. So, real estate, I think there's, you know, basically three ways you make money. Mm-hmm. That's kind of my, my pitch. But one is cash flow. And yep. this is probably the most often focused on one. Uh, but I think also kind of the most overvalued one. Mm. Second one is uh, basically equity pay down yep. or principal pay down. And third one is tax benefits. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times when you're modeling something, people only look at the, the cash flow and they really don't look at like the equity pay down or the appreciation piece of it, which is honestly usually the biggest piece of it. Mm. So, I mean, from that standpoint, I'll just say, when you have somebody, let's say your note on a two hundred thousand dollar house or duplex is uh, what about fourteen hundred a month or so. Mm-hmm. If I have somebody paying, for example, I might have somebody paying uh, ten ninety five or eleven hundred in mm-hmm. the other side. All of a sudden, my monthly note is fourteen hundred, but eleven hundred of it's paid for. Mm-hmm. So I really I have three hundred left. Yeah. Obviously, I have to either mow the lawn or pay for lawn service. And probably some repairs, you know, but effectively you're probably at four or 500 bucks a month where even just renting, you'd be paying at least double that. Double. Exactly. No, that's good, man. And I think you hit it on the head. So equity pay down, we call it phantom income around our office, right? Yeah. So it's really income that you're receiving. You're just not having to pay tax on it Mm because you're building that equity up. So no, that's good, bro. So as you kind of, now let's progress back. I really wanted to hit on that. I thought there was some good wisdom in that piece. Let's progress back now. You got into sales. You bought the first duplex, move your family in, renting out one side. 
you get into sales, what's next after that? What kind of progress? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so sales, and, and I mean, y- you know this, you you coach this probably on a daily basis, yep. but you know, I think um, getting into sales, it's it's one of those things that's kind of sexy. There's a lot of real estate shows about it. Everybody thinks it's going to be easy and fun and glamorous. Yep. And I'd say for the first six to 12 months, it's probably kind of anything but that, you know? Mm-hmm. So I literally remember every weekend I would hold open houses and I would, I would go and do 40 color flyers and I would walk the neighborhood the day before and knock on, I'd have to get rid of my flyers. Um, before I, you got in the truck. Exactly. It's yeah. like, do you like living in this neighborhood? Do you know anybody that does, or do you just want to snoop in your neighbor's house? Yeah. Come on, come yeah. on tomorrow, you know? <laughs> And then I had a uh, kind of tra- secret of the, of the trade, I guess. I had a, um, a comment card, you know, it's like an, enter a raffle for a $25 Starbucks gift card. Mm-hmm. And so if anybody was interested in buying a house, basically start making that conversa- conversation and get them to fill out the card. Yeah. You're trying to build uh, contacts. Exactly. Yeah. But so the, the kind of the spin I'll say I put on that was if anybody, I thought anybody was actually interested in a house, I would write down on the back of the card, what they were looking at and every single person who was interested would win. Mm. So probably on, you know, open houses, I probably average 30, 40 people. I'd have three, four, five winners every time. And I would go hand deliver that card to them. And get that second contact. I would say almost 100% of those people end up buying with me. Every time. I mean, I, it, a vast majority yeah, of them. Yeah, off. Yeah. So, I mean, I went from, you know, first three months, I, I don't know if I closed on anything, but I mean, I went to, I think my first year, closed on at least, or sold at least 20 homes. That's awesome. Um, and then kind of went from there. Start so. hustling. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and like you said, 200 million in sales over your individual career. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of production. Yep. What would you say if we were going to expand on that as a brand new agent or an agent trying to scale my business, what would be three things that you would tell me that would help me propel my business going forward? Uh, Have you started yet or not? Either one, trying to grow my business or just a new agent. Like, hey, here's three things that you need to make sure you do in order to become a $100 million, $200 million agent. What would that look like? One of the first things I pitch, I mean, really, regardless of kind of where you are in your career is financial stability. Mm-hmm. You know, I think financial stability and not, you don't need the Mercedes, you don't need this before you've, you know, before you've Act like it. a top producer before you are a top producer. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, from the day one, I'd say save six months of, of just like rent and expenses if you can, or yeah. have, have a plan for how to get that. The second thing I think is look for creative ways to get leads without spending the money. Sweat equity versus check equity. Exactly. I say it all. So whether, you know, the open houses and you have some sort of contact form or, you know, taking free listings, putting up, you know, Hank Robertson, you know, he was king of Craigslist, Mm -hmm. probably got a hundred plus buyers off of Craigslist for free, you know? So yeah, some of those low cost or free ways where it's like you're spending a lot of time Third, I think, is that that diligence and saying, I'm going to do, you know, whether it's three, five, seven repeatable things over and over and over that I believe are going to make me successful. I'm going to have some sort of structure to that and tracking of that, you know, whether it's there's electronic task tracking or some people live by their calendar on their phone or in person and say, I'm going to do this every single day, every day, every day or every week or on what, yep. whatever pattern you do. And say, I'm going to judge it in three months. I'm not going to judge it in a week or two when it doesn't work Mm -hmm. because you won't see that. You won't see that conversion. So that's perfect. And it's funny because it's like I explained to my agents. It's like trying to be a golfer and not willing to stand a certain way and hit the ball. There's certain fundamentals of everything in order to be successful. And you just hit the three things that I literally say to my agents. (laughs) So on the one you said, do consistently do it on a weekly basis. I call it SSC. So what is your strategy? Mm-hmm. What is your system? And then are you going to do it consistently? So I call it SSC. So strategically, systematically, and consistently. That's awesome. And then build that out as an SSC. So everything for me is acronyms. I love it because it's easy for me to remember. Yep. So when you said, hey, man, do this weekly, do this daily, do this monthly, do this quarterly. I have everybody that I, I bring in the TM5 as a new agent or an agent I'm trying to bring in and help scale their business. Mm-hmm. I say, what's your SSC? Yep. And they're like, well, I don't have a strategy. Well, let's just start there. Yeah. Now that you know you want to be a $20 million agent and you run, the, you know, you back into that, how many deals, average sales price. All right. So then what's your system? 
And then mm-hmm. how consistently are you going to do it? Yep. And man, when I force them to do that formula, it always works. Yeah. So that's good, bro. That's good. So what's one of um, the most surprising lessons that you've learned as you've built out this amazing resume in the real estate industry? What's, what's one of those lessons you're like, I wish I would have known that when I got into the game. Give me two, actually. One as a salesperson and then one as an investor. I'm hitting you with some whoppers right now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's maybe, maybe there's two of them. Mm -hmm. So like what a snowball it is, Mm -hmm. you know? And I think, again, I kind of hit on it earlier, but I think a lot of people think it's going to be this instantaneous success. And it's like, I don't think you really start hitting your stride till probably years three and four. Of the real estate. Yeah. Yeah. And it kind of the bigger thing that I think, I don't know if you call this investing, but I mean, just in life, I think this, this encompasses almost any business you're in Mm -hmm. is the aggregate, a lot of times I think the aggregate sum of your success obviously is like preparedness meaning opportunity. And I think preparedness means consistently, consistently growing and consistently learning and consistently moving in the right direction. Yeah. So, uh, so evolving consistently. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So for myself, it's like, I have this, I have this kind of unquenchable hunger to, to know more. So it's like, I was real estate sales and I was like, I want to know how these things are built. I want to know, you know, what the, where the maintenance issues can, or pieces can be better. I don't know the difference between the builders. I want to walk the job sites. I want to talk to the vendors. And then it's like, how are these people getting money? How are they getting lending? Let's talk to the lenders. Let's figure that piece out. Like, how are people doing bigger deals? What about multifamily deals? What about five, 10, $15 million deals? How are they structuring that? How can we do a, you know, how can we do $40 million a year in construction with zero cash in the deal? Wow. Like, you know what I'm saying? And it kind of just keeps going and going. And I think, so, so, I mean, that piece I think is the more you can just be hungry and consistently move in the right direction, like the more opportunity you'll have. You'll I start think. seeing. Yeah. yeah. And I, again, I think that's, you know, whether you're in McDonald's or, or real estate, mm-hmm. you know, I think that's the same thing of the more you kind of just know everything there is about the whole ecosystem you're operating within, the more value you can provide and the more opportunity yeah. you'll have. So. That's good. So I have a lot of people always ask me, as you're involved in all these deals like that you are, how did you create a strategy for that hunger that you felt? So you obviously, like you said, I want to know more about this. Did you say, all right, a couple of times a, a week, I'm going to read these books or I'm going to go on this many networking lunches? Kind of walk me through how you kept that hunger. You you kept it managed. Like, did you have a strategy behind it or walk me through that Like, as you were trying to evolve? So, I mean, full disclosure, I'm somebody who kind of, I don't know if bored is the right way, yeah. but I mean, bored is probably the right way. I get bored with challenge. So challenge can be like, like growth and creation. I've kind of said are always the things I like that I love and growth can especially be size or quantity, or it can be like market, mm. you know? So from the standpoint of like, I was selling f- three properties a month, like selling 10 or 15 a month really excite you, you know? Mm-hmm. And then you get to kind of that point. It's like, this doesn't excite me as much anymore. I've gotten, gotten pretty proficient at yeah. it. What's my next deal? What's next? Yeah. yeah. From the standpoint of really intentionally being it, I, I would say I probably from the beginning, even till now, like I am, so, I love real estate. I love almost every aspect. I love the people aspect. I love watching things physically go up. I love finding like the treasure hunt of, of what's wrong with what we're building, <laughs> uh, reviewing plans, working with deals, funding. I mean, I love every single aspect of it. And so I think there was kind of a goal from day one and there still is to, to really understand and have contacts in every part of that, that of ecosystem and environment. No, that's good. But from a strategic level, to be honest, I mean, a lot of, you know, getting involved in cons- development or getting involved in construction or getting involved in lending. It was honestly kind of a, a product of the situation I was in and solving a problem. That makes sense. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. That's good. That's good. So where would you say the biggest opportunity you see in the real estate industry over the next 12 to 24 months? Because like you said, you've been in sales, you have a portfolio, you've done multifamily syndication. Where do you see the opportunity over the next 12 to 24 months just in the industry? What would you kind of hone in on and where's your focus? Yeah. Good question. I tend to think, so from a, from a global perspective, I tend to think there's, there's 
opportunity in almost every type of deal, at least in this market. You know, so honestly, I mean, some of the stuff I'm buying personally or with with partners is some of it's land, some of it's some single family infill stuff, some's multifamily. So it's it's really pretty deal specific at mm-hmm. some level. The opportunity, so opportunity from from the next 12 to 24 months, mm-hmm. you know, right, wrong, and different, regardless of political affiliation, I think. I think we'll probably see some states be winners and losers mm-hmm. over the next 24 months. Um, and I think we've seen a lot of in-migration or we'll see a lot of in-migration continue to Texas. Mm. Um, I mean, NASDAQ is meeting with, with Abbott on Friday to discuss moving NASDAQ to, to Dallas. You know, wow. I mean, some of these big moves that are, that are, yeah, they're going to be long-term. So from that standpoint, I think Texas in general Obviously, College Station is usually a kind of a trickle down recipient of the benefit from that because the whole state. Yeah, a lot of people have kids or will have kids or whatever. Yeah. Besides that, it's, it's hard. For me. I'm really biased in this. I love residential real estate. Yeah. Um, and I love it from the the aspect of kind of having a higher calling, but also from the standpoint of people always need a roof over their head. Always. And. You know, whether they're renting or buying, there's flexibility in that end user and how you're doing it. And they're they're most, you know, statistically underwriting wise and just logically, they're most likely to pay that and make sure that that is maintained long term. Yeah. Uh, When, you know, second home, vacation home, business, commercial, sometimes that can, you know, be be second priority to keeping Mm -hmm. a roof over my family's head. So, I you know, again. We've talked about it. I think yeah. we're, we're both in some commercial stuff, both in some land stuff and stuff. And I think that's deal specific and there's very good values. Yeah. But overall, I love residential, whether it's single family, multifamily condo, and, and I love it in Texas. So walk me through, I want to dive a little deeper into that. Walk me yeah. through if, if, if I were looking at a deal with you and you were mentoring me, how would I look at a multifamily deal? Like what would kind of be the steps, kind of a flyover? And just talk me through it. Don't feel like it needs to be perfect, but just yeah. like, what does that look like? If I want to invest in a 24 unit apartment complex, 30 unit apartment complex, kind of what's your mind? How does it work? And how do you kind of calculate the returns and kind of walk me through that? Overall perspective, I'd say multifamily, especially if we're doing ground up, mm-hmm. ground up or, uh, or kind of value add something that's existing that we're rehabbing. I think, it, you know, kind of ground up is new build and value add is obviously renovation. So yes, so yes, yes, yes. good yeah. clarification. Yep. It kind of goes back, I would say, to the three ways you make money on a deal, cash mm-hmm. flow, appreciation and, and tax, mm-hmm. you know, tax savings. The biggest way you make money in that deal is appreciation mm-hmm. um, and usually building value in through that construction process. Yeah. So, you know, I think any multifamily deal, we're, we're usually looking to get out probably three, four years in on average, Mm -hmm. we usually have a plan to divest it like within a year. And we also have a contingency plan for, let's say the market's not as good as we want or the adoption's not as quick as we anticipate. Something goes in. Yeah, we need to hold it for five to seven years. Mm -hmm. Um, And we usually kind of run investors or partners through that and make sure everybody's comfortable with the returns, just the operational piece of it. But from the standpoint of what I look for in a deal, is going to be something I'm not just a I'm not just somebody who goes in and buys something long term for a coupon clipping. I'm looking for a material increase yeah. in the value and the rents that we're providing. Yeah. Um, and or a big difference between, you know, we can build it for eight million and it's worth eleven million uh, at the back end based on the pre- prevailing cap rate. Yeah. Once mm-hmm. you've leased it yep. up. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, I think also, you know, obviously the bigger you get, the more real estate is an operational business. Mm-hmm. And so making sure that you have good, uh, you, you have a property management firm, like making sure you have a good property management leasing partner in whatever market you're in yeah. is key because you're probably not going to be able to achieve and maintain your, your goals if you don't. So That leads me to the next thing because you're one of the masterminds behind the barracks and the growth of that community and kind of how it just blew up we always felt like y'all had a great team in place. Y'all had great strategy, great marketing. What what would you say the foundation of that success of that project was? I mean, the foundation was, I think, I mean, Heath, Heath is a tremendous 
tremendous partner, yeah. you know, and obviously you, you're going to have issues with any partner. <laughs> Rob's yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, it's just life. But that's life. But uh, it, he's tremendously detail oriented and I'm, I'm probably the same. Yeah. So it was yeah. the details that y'all really focused in on. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, hundred percent getting the right people on the right seat and then obsessing over the details. Mm-hmm. And that's everything from the look and feel of marketing to the layout, to where a plug is located, to the materials. I mean, literally we were looking at changing appliances. I ordered a set of appliances and, and I literally took a baseball bat to them behind the model homes <laughs> because it's like, what are students going to do and how, you know, how many maintenance issues are we going to have long term? And so, I mean, some of those things that other people are like, oh, that's funny. We should do that. You know, we actually did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, really, I think it comes down to that. Like, like what you said earlier, the, the, especially systematic and consistency, mm-hmm. that's where, I mean, we, you know, when we started, both Heath and I were, I mean, honestly, we were, we were new business people at some level, didn't have a ton of structure. And I think every, every year, every six months, we got materially better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And especially the last four or five years, you know, got really good at consistent meeting rhythms, consistency of review task tracking. So we use like a flow or a a sauna type Mm -hmm. product, you know, where we're tracking tasks and then just getting creative and, uh, and having time. It's kind of weird, but we had a, we had a a weekly meeting where we would spend about two, three hours, literally just brainstorming. Wow. And we'd each bring a couple topics and say, you know, I mean, it's anything from we're dealing with this issue to I think this might be an issue in a year to where's the market headed to I read this article. Um, and that I mean, it was it, <laughs> I'm not sure our wives loved it because it was this late night meeting that went to like 10 o'clock half the time. But it was so much good stuff came out of that. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something I probably am really bad at is intentionally carving out that time to be creative because there's. There's just, you're just going so you're much. Yeah. 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 Well, like we always say work, working on your business and not working in your business. Yep. And that's the thing that I'm always teaching my staff. When do you set aside that time to work on your business and not in your business? Cause if you just work in your business, it'll always have you by the tail. And yeah. like you said, the first years, had you guys not built the systems after the fact, you just would have kept running. Like it was still the first year, but you're nine years in. Yep. And that's where I see a lot of sales agents, a lot of investors, they keep growing in sales or they keep growing in their portfolio, Mm -hmm. but they're still trying to operate like they're a $2 million agent. It's like, no, you're an $8 million, $10 million agent now. And you're still putting the signs out and you're still trying to put the log boxes out. Right. Or, Hey, you have, you know, 25 houses, but you're still managing your portfolio. Like you have one house. And so that's where we got to evolve as the real estate entrepreneurs that we are. Cause our vision, our gifting, our success is only going to go as far as we're willing to evolve. Yep. So no, that's good, bro. That's good. Yeah. So where do you see, where are you investing your money right now? Are you putting it into real estate or are you kind of, I know at one point you and I were kind of doing a startup game and stuff and <laughs> kind of messed around with that a little bit. Yeah. I'm still, I'm still waiting for that money to come back. Yeah, that's a sore point. <laughs> I'm sorry, bro. <laughs> Hope my wife is not listening to this because she holds it over my head every once in a while. So like, like personally, I'm all about, so real estate, I love, mm-hmm. um, I have about uh, over the years over the last eight, nine years, I've bought and sold probably about a hundred plus units of property, about, about 60 of it was multifamily and yep. we, we still have, I don't know, 20 or so. Mm-hmm. So, so what I'm doing is being intentional about honestly, what I think is overvalued and what I think is undervalued mm-hmm. in my own portfolio and yeah. saying, can I flip this? I'm a huge believer in 1031s. So um, I really hope that doesn't get taken away from us. But just the the 1031 process and then taking it all the way your whole life and then getting that step up in basis and literally like never paying tax on that. Just sum. keep I'm growing. Huge. It. Yeah. I mean, you can literally get to tens of millions of dollars that you never paid income tax on, which mm-hmm. is, is awesome. Google 1031 exchange. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to go into that one. But, um, so from the standpoint of, I'm always, I'm always looking to put it into projects. I'm always looking to take what I have, sell a $300,000 property and buy a $600,000 property, grow that. And then from outside of that, it's kind of weird to say, but stock market, I'm a huge believer in Tesla. So (laughs) I'll just leave that there. I'll just leave that there, but it's done very well. 
They're in a God uh, bless Elon. I think they're in so. in, index now. What five hundred top five hundred index, whatever. Yeah, got last a, night. Yeah, I got yep. like man, that's yep. crazy, bro. Yep. So, what technologies are you using? What do you see in the real estate industry? There's so much private equity going into our industry. There's so many new technology companies. Even some of the brokerages are converting in the technology companies. What do you feel like uh, the opportunity is in our space, and what technology are you tracking or using? Hmm. So I'll, I'll, I'll take this from maybe from two standpoints, like internally from a business standpoint, there are a multitude of apps, programs, that sort of stuff to kind of manage whatever you want. Mm-hmm. I take the approach as like, I'm not going to go out and look for something that I don't have a need for. So um, property management software, we use that folio, still use that folio. It's phenomenal. App folio. Yeah. App folio or Buildium, I'd say are two, depending on your size and exactly what features you want. Uh, they're phenomenal. From a just business operation standpoint, I'm meticulous on, it sounds weird, but like Google Sheets mm-hmm. <laughs> and tracking on spreadsheets, um, as well as we use Asana right now, which is just a task tracking software where you can have multiple people and assign tasks and they can flow it back to you. And you can keep track of everything that's been completed over the last, you know, days, weeks, months, as yeah. well as like meeting items. Yeah, that's um, so being meticulous on that stuff from the standpoint of, and again, I mean, there's, if I'm an agent, like a property where, or Boomtown or something like that. Sometimes I, I, CRM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did property where I've probably liked better than the rest, but um but there's there's three or four really good ones out there. Yeah. Um, I think also from the standpoint, and again, this is a sometimes taboo topic, but like a uh, a virtual call center mm-hmm. to expand. You know, a, 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 taking the barracks from model homes from five days a week to seven days a week, expanded hours, and then getting a twenty four hour call center. So literally, it's twenty four hours a day. You get an answer probably within two minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, is game changing. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah, VA the, virtual systems. Yeah, obviously that's a gray area based yeah. on regulation, and you can you can judge that yourself. But yeah, no, that's good, bro. That's good. And then on the technology side, like where the where the industry's going, it's so hard to say. You know, yeah. I'd love to say it's infinitely scalable, and it's going to be everybody. I wouldn't love to say, but but everybody using an app. I just don't think it's going there. I think no. it's too big of a purchase. It's going to be hard to get rid of the the people aspect of it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And people, they'll always need people. They will always want, you know, for most people, it's the biggest financial investment, whether it's single family or it's a large portion of their portfolio and their investment dollars. So um, I think trusted advisors are always going to be needed there. Mm -hmm. I do think, you know, and again, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. I do think some of the bigger box brokerages kind of the traditional old ladies of real estate brands. Yeah, it's going to be tough. Yeah. I, I mean, I think- Especially if they don't innovate and, uh, and yep. adopt I've seen technology. a huge, yeah. I've seen a huge lack because I think they're afraid to cannibalize their own business. And in that, it feels like they're digging their own grave at some standpoint. So I don't, that's, For that's sure. my own feeling. But. It's getting competitive. And I, I would say, you know, when we got in the industry, the average realtor in America was 56, 57, 58 years mm-hmm. old. So it was most of the time a second career or somebody who stayed in the industry for a long time. Now you're starting to see this, like you said, the sexy real estate shows, but it's now a 20s and 30s and 40s type career. And um, when you bring in a millennial, they're just going to do things a different way. And uh, we're right on the tail end of the millennials, but we're still millennials. Yep. And so, you know, whether it's Facebook or whatever, that innovation is, is tough for a lot of the brokerages to innovate. And that's where you're seeing a lot of independents are starting to merge. So it's a, it's a lot of, um, it's a lot of shifting in our industry for sure. In the real estate sales side. Yeah. Well, I mean, at one point you were the number one agent in the century 21 network worldwide, right? In the country, in the United States, in the United States. That's a big deal. (laughs) (laughs) That's a big deal. So, so yeah, I mean, you touched on it. I, I was part of the barracks. Um, and in 2015, we sold, it was about 175 properties inside the barracks. And then I sold about, it was 234 and a half to a total. So Never forget the half. The half, not the half, <laughs> but whatever that equals to 50, 60 plus outside the barracks as well. What was that um, volume that year? What was that volume, total sales volume? Do you remember? 
It was obviously north of 50 million for sure. Yeah. It was about, I'd probably say right around 50 million. Yeah. 50, 52, something like that. Man. I probably have it on, yeah. on a video somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, and it comes down to the obsessive detail oriented, you know, fortunately at that time, it wouldn't have been possible if we had kids, yeah. but, um, we were just, we had a kid at the end of the year, uh, Kirsten, our first daughter, but yeah, it was me and Drew. So basically a real estate assistant kind of transaction coordinator. Grinding. We were in the same office back to back. Yeah. I mean, just taking calls, both of us taking calls 12 hours a day. Just, just slaying maybe yeah. it's the best way but it, again it comes down to i think the intentionality and obsessing over some of the details so it's like you know some of the and, and looking at psychology so it's as simple as getting a plat map you know that's that's pretty that's illustrated and then putting on a horizontal plane because the research shows people are able to conceptualize a horizontal plane because that's how it is in the world versus something on the wall mm. and it um it was taking you know, five granite options and three or four paint samples and a couple other selections and saying, we have decision fatigue. We're going to pare that down. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you have one granite option, you have one paint color. And if, if you want any changes, it's an automatic $1,500 change fee. Mm -hmm. And it cut out a lot of changes. Yeah. Um, and so it, it was just that kind of every, like you know, that month, two, three, six months, whatever, looking and saying, how can we simplify? How can we maintain the velocity? And how can we, I think a big piece in, in real estate, especially when you're doing like developments mm -hmm. is building that anticipation and demands. How do we yeah. build off the people that were excited, get more people excited, have a uh, kind of a release state or whatever, build the anticipation and then have and a clear call to action. Yeah, I mean, we sold I mean, in 24 hours, it sold 36 properties or something. I mean, you know, it's like stuff that's not, not possible normal. without that system. So, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, it'd be very hard to sell that many if you didn't have a development pipeline. Yeah. <laughs> I get that. Yeah, producing, so, producing the product. Yeah. Yeah. But there's also a lot of optimizations within that yeah. pipeline. And I so. was at a, I think it was a real estate webmaster seminar or conference and Frederick Eklund was there from yeah. the millionaire New York show or whatever. And he said the same thing. If you want to scale your business and you want to consistently produce top, top numbers in your market, you got to have a developer. Yep. You got to have a townhome project, a high rise condo project, a production builder, something mm -hmm. like that. That's going to produce it over and over again. Cause we know in our industry, we go out and do a great job for somebody, sell their house within the first week, closing goes well. They shake your hand, they give you a hug, take a photo. They love you as their broker, but you just fired yourself. Yeah. You don't have a job. Yep. We're in the industry where you actually do a great job and still get fired. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to figure out how to replicate that over and over again. And you hit it on the head because you had that pipeline of business. Yeah. Well, I, I, you also have to, I mean, and this is kind of going into the weeds that I, I usually don't share, but I think you have to be cognizant of how much how much you're getting paid and what value you're bringing, mm -hmm. you know? So there was a clear within the barracks, there was a clear, in my mind, there was a clear kind of pivot point at which I realized Heath probably thinks I make too much money, mm -hmm. you know? And so from that standpoint, it's like, how can I provide more value and take more of these problems off his plate? And at, at some level, that's the reason why I got into the construction piece because yep. the, you know, it's like, well, if, if I'm doing this and this and this, It'll hopefully provide more value. And honestly, that'll help me out because I'm not promising something to the buyers that I'm not able to perform on myself and make you sure it happens. Control it. Exactly. Control. So it was kind of a kind of a win-win. But yeah. um, I think so many again, it kind of goes back to you have to constantly stay on your toes and constantly keep your eyes open because the extreme value you provided at some point can also it can almost be providing too much value <laughs> yeah. to a point where like well, I'm paying you, you know, I'm paying you twice or three times what I'd pay somebody if I were to hire them in house. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go that route. And even if I sell 10 less houses a year, it's totally fine. I'm still, still up. Still breaking even. Yeah. Yeah. Still up. Yep. yeah that's so. good. That makes sense, bro. So what are you doing right now to grow? Right. Because we talked about as a real estate entrepreneur, you got to always be growing, evolving. What are you doing to invest back in yourself? Is it going to yoga class or... <laughs> <laughs> Like, talk me, walk me through that. You know, yeah. what are you doing to invest in you? Because you're always investing in everybody else. What are you doing to invest in you? 
So I think, I, I mean, I'll say investing in myself, I, I don't claim to have, have really anything mastered at this point. You know, mm-hmm. I think it's a constant evolution of trying to get better. Yeah. Um, reading is huge for me. Um, and simplifying that reading process. And I'll say like a, like a Blinkist or a masterclass or something that's summarizing information for mm, you. Making it quicker. To yeah. It allows you, to, you know, it's like I've effectively got information from 50 books this last year w- with the, you know, reading about five total, you know, I think staying for just the markets in general. I think that's a huge piece that like realtors so often don't understand or realize, but like, if you're an agent right now, you don't understand why lumber spiked mm. and you don't understand what you think lumber is going to do in the future. And you don't understand how that's going to affect home prices and resale prices and how long interest rates are going to be low. I mean, those are the things you should understand because they're intangibly tied to what, what you should be recommending now, what you should be recommending for an investment long term. Man, that's great. So the intangibles around the industry. hundred percent. Yeah. And, and a lot of that's just like reading Yahoo Finance or mm-hmm. Google Finance or, you know, and it can be five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day. There's even some, you know, little subscriptions where once a week I get emailed like a three minute video and it summarizes everything that's happened in financial markets, US and worldwide, you know. So, I mean, there's some really simple, repeatable, consistent things SSC, you can put in place. I, mean, uh, I need to that, trademark that SSC. You know, and then thinking of every interaction that you have in light of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, again, I mean, one of the, probably the best book that I've ever read, I think that I, I have read several times is timing the real estate market by this, this billionaire guy in, in Dallas. It's called timing the real estate market, timing the real estate market, Craig Hall. And, uh, it goes through the seven and I think I'm saying this right. I think it's seven, seven factors, uh, and three are micro and four are macro that, that affect real estate markets. Mm-hmm. And it's everything from path of progress. So where it's going, it's inflation, job creation, in-migration, out-migration. I'm missing a couple, obviously. But again, there's time and time again, I actually go back to that and I say, is Texas still a good market? Mm. And every time I go back every time to you it, read that book and go through it all. Every time I go back to it, it's like all the controllables are about as good as they can be in Texas. And yeah, there's some, you know, inflation rate and, you know, currency values and some of that stuff that, that are a little bit out of our control that we have to keep tabs on. But again, it's keeping tabs on those things to say like, are more people going to buy houses or rent houses 10 years from now? Mm -hmm. Where's the market going? Where do we need to be? Trying to get Uh, out in front of it. hundred percent. Yep. That's good, bro. So that leads me to the next thing. What books do you recommend? You just went over one of them. I did. Time in the real estate market. What's the other one? Go Giver is, uh, mm-hmm. is con. I mean, if you haven't read it, it's not a real estate book. It's really just a, like a success life book. Have you read it? I haven't. Dude, you have I will. to. It's an easy, plain read. Okay. On any two or three hour flight, you can read the whole thing. So, what's the uh, takeaway from that one? It goes through, uh, basically five different determiners of like what it needs to be, like what, what success can equal is mm-hmm. probably the easiest way to say it. Yeah. And I literally, like at the barracks, we, we did this uh, where we'd take a turn and kind of teach the rest of the employees oh, yeah. yeah, on like a book you read or, or business topics. And so I did this. But what, I mean, one of the big ones is scale. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you can do something big or do something small. But it takes the same amount of energy. Yeah, very <laughs> similar. Very similar. Yeah. And it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's actually, it's interesting because it's a fictional book, but it covers these, it, it's engaging but it covers these really strong topics. And like the scale one is, you know, he goes in, and he's talking to this lady who started, I think it's a daycare learning, learning platform, online learning platform. Mm-hmm. And it's like, she didn't necessarily do anything that much better than, she didn't work harder per se necessarily than the, the teacher down the street, you know, who's teaching one class. But she found out how to bring the same value or slightly better value to a mass number of people. Makes sense. Um, and so it's these simple bin- business concepts that I think you can apply to, I mean, no, real, real estate or almost anything. Yeah. So. It's either problem solving or innovation. Exactly. That's really where it's at now. Yeah. No, that's good, man. So as we get ready to close, what, what's a final thought you would want the audience to know? And like, what would you want to leave the listeners with if you had a, a final nugget? Probably keep hustling and be intentional about everything you do. Yeah. Um, and that's, 
I'm huge on intentionality and consistency. I mean, we, we probably have different words for it, but very similar things. Yeah. And that's, that's everything from the business things we've talked about to, you know, I have a weekly date night with my wife Wednesday night at six o'clock, you know, keep and we it. Have babysitter. Yeah. You keep Do it. Not and you have, <laughs> yeah. And just building some consistencies, whether it's exercise, time with your significant other family, business rituals, just determine what you are and be intentional about it. And even, sorry, good, but like seven habits of highly effective people or uh, Jordan Peterson's 12 rules for life have very similar concept as like begin with the end in mind. Right. Mm. So like one of the things we've done, Brittany and I've done is sit down and say, and this probably is personal and business, but where do we want to be when we're 60? Mm-hmm. What does that look like? What does that feel like? What does that smell like? What type of relationship do we want to have with our kids? What type of kids do we want to have? What skills do they want to have? What about 10 years from now? What about five years from now? What about one year from now? And then you can kind of build a, I'll say a family and business plan off of that. And then our goals on an annual bait, we do, you know, I at least do like new year's goals, mm-hmm. if you will. Yep. But a lot of times that's looking back at the plan we created three years ago and saying, do I, do I still want these things? And then like, what can I do this year to get to, Closer to that top? Exactly. Yeah. On, in every aspect. That's good. So, intentionality is huge. Yeah. You know, traction has a thing called VTO vision traction organizer. Yeah. It's a little one yep. page deal. One year, three year, five year. So yeah, it's good, man. Very similar. Well, man, I love you, bro. Thank you for hey. being on the show. Thanks for having you me. You are the atypical real estate entrepreneur. And honestly, we didn't even get to cover a lot of the other stuff you got going on. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this dude's killing it in the game. Keep up with him, man. He's going to take over the world. So appreciate it, man. Dude, thank you, sir. Yep. Have yep. a good one, Terrence. Yep.